Welcome to Art Talks, Art Matters. I'm your host, Jerome Meadows, founder and director of Indigo Sky Community Gallery here in Savannah, Georgia. This program showcases Savannah's expansive art scene of visual, literary, theatrical, and musical formats for your discovery and enjoyment. Art Talks, Art Matters gets to the heart of the art with the individuals and organizations that create it, perform it, curate, and collect it. Our guests will present and discuss how the arts can enrich all of us in surprising and countless ways. The arts in Savannah have a rather particular history, especially when you consider that there are two figures standing atop City Hall, two female figures, one representing commerce and the other representing the arts. Uh, they're of equal stature, equal size, equal prominence, and they suggest strongly that the city of Savannah intended both the arts and commerce to be enshrined in the city's history and identity. So if you fast forward to a few years ago, up until now, we have a major initiative underway to establish Savannah as an arts destination. I'm sure you're very well aware mm -hmm. of that. Yeah. Um, but as best I can tell, most of the individuals involved in that, including myself, are from elsewhere. They're not from Savannah. So it's for that reason that I'm really delighted <laughs> to have two homegrown individuals, accomplished artists in your own right. Maggie, you came here at the age of five. Mm -hmm. Matt, you were born here. The age of four. Age of four, okay. <laughs> but for all intents and purposes, this is your hometown. And uh, you've seen this city grow and develop over the years. Mm -hmm. So welcome, Maggie Hayes, Matt Tool. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> My pleasure to have you here. Awesome. Uh, so we're going to start uh, looking at the work that you do as artists. And Matt, I'd like to start with you. Sure. Um, you have said that you identify yourself as a sculptor who occasionally conducts performances to showcase the ritual of making, quote unquote. So we have a clip of one of your performances. If you could give us a little bit of background on this as we watch it. The, this particular work was created uh, for an international iron conference that was held in Wales. Okay. And it's called Kinship, a Tribute of Iron. And essentially it is play, paying tribute to the iron casters, the sculptors who work in this material. And uh -huh. it is a ritual um, toast, if you will, um, mm. that would celebrate the makers. So um, I want to bring people to the moment when the work of art is created so that they have a different relationship to the objects. Um, and so in this event, there's music uh, for this particular piece because it was Wales. There's a deep or a rich history in singing in the minds of Wales. So uh, we brought in song and then the toast is Yaki Da, which is Welsh for cheers or to health. So uh, we would bring the two pieces, to, uh, the levers together, toast, and then pour them into a wooden mold that would burn away to reveal the new sculpture that was created. So you participate in several of these rituals of making. I, I do. It's something that um, it gives me the opportunity to explore sculpture at a larger scale, to incorporate different media through sound. We, I usually work with a sound artist or a, a band. Um, there's poetry that happens at times. Um, it, it, it allows me to explore um, and, uh, my uh, <laughs> uh, exploration with fire, my <laughs> indulge my pyromaniacal uh, tendency, <laughs> essentially is what it's doing. But you also work on smaller pieces using found objects. I do. Um, there are collections of objects that I find when out hiking or kayaking. Um, I collect, I, I love going to junkyards and picking up materials. And I use found objects in the performances. Uh, they're just larger in scale. Mm -hmm. And then the smaller ones, I really want to focus on the beauty of the object and, and the forces that were involved in, in modifying them to, to, to make their, uh, they are sculpted by the forces of nature. And I just want to point that out. This seems to be a combination of those smaller pieces as well as your performances. Are these maquettes for what you eventually do as a performer? They are maquettes. So uh, as, you, as you may know, that uh, building models to give you an idea of 
um, scale, proportion, how they're going to work together uh, that's integral to uh, sculpting at um, kind of a, more of a commission size, larger scale. So these were the smaller models that were intended to justify the design, to sell it to the committee that would mm -hmm. approve it, and uh, just to give me an idea of how it would be organized. And I could move them around um, on the table to get a different uh, organizational kind of uh, composition. And how about the next image? So this moves a little bit closer toward, uh, this is the, some of the found objects. Um, the branch, what I'm really interested in seeing is the, the, the struggle that the branch has over its lifetime. It's a, it's a record of its history, reaching out to find light. I think that's mm. fascinating. That's exactly how I look at the work as well. It really, I'm, it, you, you can see the forces of uh, change and things over time. They run throughout, uh, there are themes throughout my work. And then the found objects, the, the beak of this piece, which is called Avian, is actually from uh, an abandoned car on Ossabaugh Island, one of our Georgia barrier islands. And it oh, was cool. a, a Ford Tempest or a Pontiac Tempest. I, I don't know the make of the car. <laughs> um, but that's what made up the beak. And then at the bottom is a cast iron cup, which is what you would pour metal into. And that would be the funnel that would direct it to the objects. And then wooden bases and just... One of the things I'm interested in is blending these things together in a manner that doesn't speak to one piece or the pieces individually, but to a unified whole. So attention to contours, transitions using epoxies from metal to wood and back okay. to metal or mm -hmm. metal to glass and combining the materials in a fluid manner that right. unifies them. It's very Maggie, fluid what, what in that way. Thank you. Yeah, I, I love the combination because you sort of... It makes me think of some other things where you're sort of having to guess if it's made to look like a certain material or if it actually is. Like with the wood, I was sort of like, okay, that could be actually wood or it could be made to look like wood. And then as it continued to be the metal at the beak and things, it's like it gives you this little play of like the manipulation, what's, what's the natural manipulation and what's the artist's manipulation. And that's really... Lovely. So there's an uncertainty yeah, that's, that's engaging good. and intriguing. Yeah. What, what size is this piece? Oh, it stands about 16, 18 inches, okay. something like that. Um, yeah. Just uh, very quickly, for um, you said that uh, with respect to the performance sculptures, and if we could have the next slide, um, that they perform, not me. This is a quote from you. Uh, yeah, I, um, it's interesting you're showing this image, which is more of a portrait from this event um, in Ireland where I'm essentially operating the furnace that's back in the background over my shoulder. But what I uh, mean by that, that the sculptures are meant to be the performers. I call them actually performance sculptures at times because I'm more of a stagehand helping them to do what they're supposed to do. And a lot of this is based on my interest in the work of Jean Tinglet, who made these metamatic machines that were drawing machines. They were sculptures mm. that made art. Mm -hmm. um, so I see some of the objects that I make, these levers and all, as sculptural elements that pour into molds that are sculptural elements that reveal new sculptures. So the furnace is a sculpture. The means to move it is a sculpture. The activity is a work of art, a performance. So, I see myself less of the performance artist, but rather a, a facilitator for the performances to happen. Okay. I love that the the levers and all of this becomes animated. Like even with the maquette, I was like, "There's a, like they have so much personality, even in just the object Small of scale. you know what's used to make these sculptures." And it's nice to sort of have that highlighted for an audience that would never normally see that part of the process. And then all of a sudden there's these like beautiful, almost animal-like um, <laughs> structures working nice. together to create a new sculpture. Thank it's you. wonderful. I know it, okay. we're all limited on time. Yes. I was just thinking about Alexander Calder's circus where he would work Absolutely. with to make it happen. Yeah. Really, yeah. Really That's really one great. of my favorites. <laughs> so let's take a look at some of what you do, Maggie. Okay. Um, you moved to Savannah again at the age of five. You've lived here ever since. Mm -hmm. um, what's the medium that you work in? What's your preferred style of working? Any, anything. <laughs> anything. Okay. Anything. I feel like um, I've really enjoyed putting together exhibitions where maybe it's a challenge to guess that it's a solo exhibition, like that there could be more than one 
art mind at work because I do like to play in a lot of different um, mediums and sort of, I guess, styles. Like, it's hard for me to sort of pin myself down at this point, and maybe I will change, but it's nice for me to have these sort of grouping of exhibitions to give me like an overarching message to try to convey rather than having like a specific medium to work through. Kind of work backwards. <laughs> try to figure out a message and then whatever mediums carry that message well is what I like to work in. So your artist's voice is what guides you? Yes. Um, I will say that uh, I understand that your mom was instrumental in your development as an artist, mm -hmm. um, giving you paints, you and your sister, and basically telling you to go wild with it. Yeah, we had pretty free reign. I think that it was much easier to just throw us in a, we, we had like a plastic kiddie pool. <laughs> so she would just throw us with an empty, you know, plastic pool and let us play with paint and then she'd throw us in the bathtub. And that could be a whole day's worth of fun. <laughs> so I think she realized that art had a, had a good chance at entertaining us. And she's an elementary school art teacher as well. So that was, uh, yeah, no doubt influential. <laughs> That's amazing. So this was not the yeah. <laughs> standing in front of an easel and painting. It sounds like it was an all immersive. It was always playing, which yeah. that almost made it difficult for me to sort of transition into taking art seriously as like a professional concept because it was always just this playful that. thing that I did all the time. <laughs> um, yeah. So it took me sort of realizing like, oh, actually, if I'm spending $200 a month on wood and canvas, I should probably take myself a little more seriously okay. so, I can, so I can keep doing this as, you know, forever. Yeah. Well, let's look at more of what you do. Sure. Uh, we've shown this piece on our show previously. I, I think it's oh, one with, of your um, Thank you. And you were a showcase artist. That's nice. Um, uh, you also said that uh, your dad deserves some some credit as well. Yes. Uh, well, he bit. he was collecting art even before he met my mom. And this is a 12 12 foot by 8 foot portrait I did of him. So wow. <laughs> this and it is looks a like good. A yeah, it's um three sections and um the left side shows uh him as a young man. So there was this great picture that a professional photographer took of him diving at a pool. I guess a photographer was just hanging out and was like, hey, can you do that again? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, so we found this amazing black and white um, photo of him diving at probably 17 or so. And then I had him go to the pool with me and I took um, all this video and different photos from different angles of him jumping off the diving board at 67, so a 50 year. Um, change and that was included in a exhibition I did sort of about the challenges and the beauty of masculinity so yes. one of those things being the that was at Walmart right? yeah the beauty of aging so um, my dad has beauty, yeah my dad has taken a lot of um, consideration into his health and his you know ability to stay active throughout his life so this was something that I called Superman at 17 and Superman at 67. Matt, what do you think of this piece? Well, I was just thinking as she was speaking about the beauty of aging and, and how I, you know, it shows history and mm -hmm. just that, like, wrinkles and the, the, the bends in wood and the wrinkles in one's face, it shows mm -hmm. their history. And what I really enjoy about this is that uh, the, the athleticism of it, but over time in its, you can see the, the the gracefulness of seventeen, and the uh -huh. grace is the it has a similar kind of um, aesthetic, but the body has taken on a lot more uh -huh. in terms of time. Um, a lot more storytelling. A lot more story. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a history. There's a rich history. This, that's sure. the, that's the thing about age and the wisdom. The body carries the wisdom. Um, yeah. As well after as the another, mind. you know, several years of playing football and face it, yeah. and um, it and, hurts. And, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think it's a wonderful piece, and I, I, I go back to some, like I was thinking of Stag at Sharky's, that great painting where the boxers and then the painting earlier in the boxers. I love the, the mm -hmm. physicality of it. And the, well, one thing that beautiful. the two of you seem to share in common to some extent is, um, would be your installations, mm -hmm. um, which become 
a performance venue as well. What is your experience with installations and public art? So it's kind of interesting because Savannah obviously has a unique relationship with public art where it has um, you know, finally gotten a channel that you can work through and it's very procedural to get an approval. And, um, and then other cities, like I commissioned an artist to paint a building that I was renting. I wasn't even the owner of the building. <laughs> and I commissioned an artist to paint the outside of it and the landlord was just like, Oh, awesome. <laughs> and so that was kind of lucky. The, the city had no No, the city input in that had no that. input. The neighborhood just would come by and, you know, they were like, oh, we really like what you did. And that artist has since, you know, he was already very popular, but he's since become very well known. And so I, I hope that they'll keep it for quite a long time because he's managed to become very so internationally what is this renowned. Piece? What is this piece? And then this is um, Jack Johnson is the uh, celebrated figure here. And um, it was a piece that I did also in conjunction with um, this exhibition on masculinity. So this was the outside of the gallery that I got lucky enough to pair that um, opportunity together with the exhibition. And this is still there, so that's fun. A year later, it's and still... And there is Walmart. And yeah, this is a Walmart gallery. Um, it's on Montgomery Street, which is, you know, this was very exciting having grown up here. And like, you just have a certain relationship with different neighborhoods and things as far as their visual history. And something about Montgomery and Waters both, as well as MLK, like the history of hand-painted signs and things were always really like a very just natural fabric of my experience of Savannah. That's a perfect segue. Yeah, <laughs> okay, perfect. Uh, but for people who would like to go see this, what's the cross street? Um, it is Montgomery between 35th and 36th. Good, nice. good, okay. Nice. Um, so, you're both growing up here in Savannah. You've mm -hmm. seen a lot of change. I've been here since uh, 1997, and I've seen some of that change, but mm -hmm. it often, um, I often wonder what it must have been like to walk along Broad Street as a child um, before it um, became what it is today, a reflection of Charleston. <laughs> <laughs> um, but so how would you say the art scene has changed here, um, briefly, since your based on your experience? Well, you got here in 97, and at that point I was in first grade. So we may have a similar, oh, <laughs> we may have a similar timeline of things because that's, that's an interesting I, um, you know, sort of even growing up here, you wouldn't be aware of the same things as an adult as you were in a, as a child. But something that definitely became obvious was sort of the um, real estate being refurbished a lot as far as the renovations where for a while like going down 37th a lot of those buildings were just like these gorgeous bones that had you know no one taking care of them and um, I think that partially the SCAD coming in and being able to create a market for rental properties and other things um, you saw a lot of buildings that might have otherwise just you know, been <laughs> washed away basically with um, with time being reinvested into, and certain corridors in town being reinvested into. So that was that was an obvious thing for me, sort of, as yeah. I was being toted around <laughs> as a child. <laughs> what, what what were your perspectives on that? Um, well, in 1997, I was in third grade, but I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I, I didn't tell you I moved here. I know. <laughs> so a few years after, um, you know, I, I've seen from the 70s, uh, late 70s, how Savannah was, and then through high school in the early 90s, uh, late 80s, early 90s in college, and, and it, it has changed dramatically. So uh, with, with SCAD coming in and the population of artists, art students, and then those students stay and other artists come, such as yourself, um, it has changed dramatically. Um, it's offered new um, kind of attention and opportunity. But, but going back to the two figures on the City Hall, interesting you were talking about this, and you could see 
how the buildings have changed. People have invested in property, which mm -hmm. has brought our economy up. And we're watching it happen indirectly as a result of the college. Yeah. But even Starland area, that district, they're building up because of creative thinkers that mm -hmm. stick around or they come here as a destination. And it does help the economy. You see this in city after city after city where portions of the city might be um, deprived at a certain point in terms of economic interest. And then when the artists come in, they work on it, they make it cool, and then the investors come in. So mm -hmm. that's happening. And I'm glad to see that's happening. So uh, SCAD has a lot to do with that, no doubt. But artists that have decided to stay, we still need to continue working together to build that presence. And I think we need to mm -hmm. help the city itself, those in charge of the city, understand the importance the financial gain that is mm -hmm. uh, to be derived from a direct input mm -hmm. into the arts rather than a passive let somebody else do it and i think that that talks uh, to your initial opening statement right? sure i think so, we carry a similar sentiment in that regard yeah. then but that that looks at it on the macro level on the micro level as accomplished artists as individuals who um, live here um, how do you maintain your artistic practice? How do you further your career? What, what, what's the nuts and bolts of that? Um, I work seven days a week doing other jobs also. <laughs> Tell us about that. I mean, that's the reality <laughs> yeah, for a lot this, of people of how, I mean, what it takes to survive as an artist. For me, I, I'm still enjoying the, one, the social aspect of work that ultimately I can kind of write it off as like I'm meeting people that will then be interested in my art as well. But, and I love teaching yoga. That's one of my day jobs. Um, and I kind of see that as an expressive way. Like ultimately I feel that in the way of helping others that art and yoga teaching or giving people a greater sense of freedom in their bodies and their lives by experiencing those things. So I can kind of lump that together. And then I also work at Collins Quarter, which is a blast and super busy, crazy restaurant. So um, when do you have time in the studio? Or how, um, do, you, how do you make time in the studio? I stay up late <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> um, and if I am only teaching one yoga class, then I get to spend the whole rest of the day painting or doing whatever. Um, but I, I think that ultimately, if you're driven to do something, you'll find the hours. And I'm trying to use my youth with all the energy that I have at this point. Mm, yes. <laughs> and, um, you know, I imagine that as I, there will be turning points as there have with other phases of my life where ultimately something doesn't quite fit anymore and so you have to move on to the next evolution and okay. I think ultimately that evolution will bring me to full-time art making but for now I'm still enjoying the the roller coaster of you know getting a paycheck from somewhere else. <laughs> and how about you Matt? Well just thinking about the 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 journey the history the timeline of where you are at certain times in your life and then the destination down the line, um, hopefully for a while down the line. But um, you find the time wherever you can, I guess. Yeah. That's what you do. And for the longest time, I, I would work in, I went from being a metal fabricator, which was very difficult uh, on my body, um, which is nice that you're doing yoga because that's very good for your body. <laughs> I, I need to get involved in that. But then in a professor position for about 11 years from George mm -hmm. Southern through SCAD, I was in the arts, so I talked about it all day, and I thought about it, and I learned from my students, so mm -hmm. I was continually making, but there were many hours devoted to my students and right. to um, the, the college itself. So now that I've left the college and I'm doing my own thing, now I have to earn money, <laughs> which is that strain yeah. of stress that, I, that you just spoke about. Uh -huh. um, but I'm making the time, I make that my primary mm -hmm. um, directive, so it, it's still very interrelated. Thinking about selling my work has just now come to light. So how do I, what do I do to support my art habit? I do construction type stuff, but I also do art making. And mm -hmm. I'm more on a 50-50 rather than a 70-30 or sure. 20 whatever percentage, luckily. Okay. Um, so with the remaining time, it sounds like uh, both of you are committed to remaining in Savannah. 
Is that true, or you don't want to go on record for that? <laughs> oh, I mean, life, At life least for is the time full. Being. I'm sort of like I walk out of the door, and if it's raining, then I get wet, and if it's sunny, then I'm dry. <laughs> so, as far as staying in Savannah, it's like I can only speak for really today and any foreseeable future that I'm. I love my house. I love my community here, and I'm happy to be here as long as the opportunities that I can sort of gather from here allow me to have art happening other places because that's a yeah you have to get out of the market here in order to be successful at that sure. larger level I think and Matt you know I've traveled around a pretty good amount it sounds like you have too and I've come back to Savannah mm -hmm. um, from Minneapolis in the winters, which Georgia boy does not need to be in Minneapolis. In yeah. <laughs> um, I love the city, but uh, the weather was tough. But Savannah's my home. Yeah. Um, it was great to grow up here and leave for 18 years to come back to it. Um, I love the marshes. I love the mm -hmm. waterways and the islands. And that's inspired my work dramatically. Maggie, I want to thank you very much for being a guest on our program. Thank you for having um, me. And we will have information during the credits for where people can contact you via email and your website. Awesome. And Matt, good friend, old friend, thank you. <laughs> thank you so thank much you, for being here. I appreciate uh, it. Again, I'm delighted to uh, bring voice to artists who grew up here because I think with all of the, uh, the nowness and the newness, sometimes we forget the fact that uh, uh, there's a history here and there's people who are artists who grew up here and uh, it's your home. So, again, thank you very thank much. You so much. Thank you, Jerome. Yeah, <laughs> thank you for watching Art Talks, Art Matters, and we'll see you next time. For more information about artist Matt Tool, visit matttool.com or contact him by email at matttool at hotmail.com. For more information about artist Maggie Hayes, visit her website, www.maggie-hayes.com or email her at thehouseofhayes at gmail.com.